So it's great to have this opportunity to um, talk about publication, especially for osteopaths. Um, I'm going to take you through some information which is um, focused a little bit on the International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine, but also relevant to other journals as well. Um, doing this for NCOR, National Council of Osteopathic Research, and um, other institutions as well, British School of Osteopathy will already use this material too. Um, to give you an overview, I want to talk about the whole process of publication, right through to developing, from developing a manuscript to um, submitting the manuscript and then the review process. But first up, looking at whether you've actually got something that's worth, uh, worth publishing or not. Then we'll talk a bit about scientific writing, how to build up the content of an article, um, and then submission in the review process. So first up, how to get published in a research journal. So these are the, the questions I'm posing now, is, is kind of the steps you need to take um, before you actually start writing, um, then the language needed in a manuscript, um, and then the structure of the article itself. So, what steps? Well, first up, you need to think about have you got something new and relevant? Um, have you got anything that's kind of rationalizing, or refining? In, in osteopathy, we've got lots of room to appraise current theory. Some of our current theory dates back to, well, 1900s, 1950s. It needs reviewing, it needs rethinking. Theory needs appraising, um, looking at again, and new ideas need proposing. And certainly those sort of articles are welcome. The International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine has published um, commentaries and uh, theoretical papers before, and we'd welcome those. But also it might be a more systematic review of a particular field, a review of, for example, something I've been working on recently is looking at uh, reassurance um, and what, what, what constitutes effective reassurance. Um, other reviews that, that I've been involved in in the past are looking at psychological factors that predict poor outcome in patients with back pain. And there's plenty of room for systematic reviews uh, and they're often um, widely cited and published. But I suppose the focus is, for most articles, most journals, is new original results or, or methods. So, if you've got something along those lines, or a synthesis, appraisal, new data, um, you're ready to publish. And what you need now is to, at the end of the day, all these things for, to get them published, to get to an editor, to get through to reviewers, you're presenting an argument. And so you need a strong manuscript that makes clear sense, is appealing firstly to the editors, then the reviewers, and then finally it has to have a good appeal to, to the likely um, readers of the journal. So what makes a strong manuscript? It has to be clear, has to have utility, usefulness for, for, for readers and or researchers, and an exciting message. Now often research um, journals are, are reviewed by researchers and read by clinicians. So as an author, you need to think about what sort of journal you're writing for. You're writing for a mostly clinical audience, but you have to uh, write in a research-informed context. You're writing mostly for other researchers, and that'll, that'll be an important in terms of how clear and exciting your message is, thinking about who your audience is. It has to be presented and constructed in a logical manner. You know, as I mentioned already, it is an argument, and so you're building your premises, you're making assertions, and you're supporting them with evidence. And that might be evidence that you're citing from the literature, but it also might be evidence that you're producing in your results. And that's the argument, and, and you're supporting um, that argument with evidence, either in the results or from the literature. And it has to be clear fairly quickly, because reviewers and editors and the like are all busy people, mostly doing things like this in their spare time. Uh, reviewers do this for free, um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the talk, um, but that message has to be clear very quickly, um, that abstract has to be clear, kind of what's new here, what's exciting, how's it useful. So choosing the right journal, um, it's important to look at a range of journals, uh, a, key, key, a, a key tip is to look at the kind of journals that you're referencing already in your work, um, that are publishing work in your area. So look at those journals, look at the aims and the scope, and you'd be surprised how often um, I get manuscripts in where people haven't done this. I got one in just, just recently, which was about uh, recovery from multiple severe uh, road traffic trauma, 
uh, orthopedic fractures and a new protocol for managing that. And what happened, these authors um, from a different country, they'd looked at the title of the journal, Osteopathic Medicine, and presumed it was all about osteopathic pathology, not about osteopathic um, manual therapy and osteopathic um, treatment, osteopathy per se. And they'd submitted the journal, they submitted an article to us. And it was clearly outside the aims and scope of the journal. You can also have a look at the types of articles that have been accepted before, um, think about the readership, and also think about, you know, are there any hot topics around? So at the moment, um, you might be thinking about, um, in manual therapy, musculoskeletal medicine, about um, classification of patients, prediction models, identifying um, subgroups of patients is a, uh, an example of a hot topic. So these are all Elsevier journals. Um, you know, work for the International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine as well as British School of Osteopathy. Uh, there's a selection of journals here that, that might be of relevance to, to osteopaths and other people in the field. Um, there are plenty to look at. It's a competitive field and journals um, are keen to get copy in and there's a range of different journals you can have a look at. So moving on to that, thinking about the right journal. Um, nowadays people mostly do research with colleagues um, and it's worth discussing it. You know, your person responsible for submitting it is probably going to be the first author. Um, but it's worth talking to either colleagues or a supervisor if you've been doing your work as part of a, a, part of a study um, for a particular award. Um, what you mustn't do, and I've come across this, I'm, I'm doing a systematic review and I came across a, um, a piece of work that someone else had published in two journals at the same time, um, which is not good and uh, the journals concerned um, if they find out, they'll be very upset about it because you sign a, essentially you sign a contract saying that you're only going to publish it in one journal. So look at those references that you're citing and think about which journal, but don't put your work into two journals at the same time. Now, one of the things you need to do, and this is a theme, um, as a new author or as an experienced author even, is to look at that guide for authors. And we'll come back to that again. So that's that on any, any journal, you, if you search the journal, they'll have a website and there'll be a guide for authors. And most journals still publish their guide for authors in their hard copy of the journal. So, just to summarise, it's about thinking about, am I ready? Have I got something worth publishing? What's my style of manuscript? Is it a new piece of research? Is it a systematic review? Is it a professional issue? Uh, is it a commentary? Is it a theory appraisal and review? What's this type of manuscript I'm doing? And then targeting the particular journal you're interested in and thinking, you know, this is going to be published in that journal and you're writing to that journal. And, of course, check the guide for authors. So what's the sort of language that, that needs doing? Now, it might be worth pausing for a second yourselves and just think, what are some of the characteristics of a good manuscript? Now, when you're thinking about that, you're, you're kind of, you've opened up a paper and you've started to read. Maybe you might just look at that title for a minute and then get straight to the introduction or the results. And the kind of things you want is, is clarity, um, easily, easy to digest information. Now, when you're thinking about what's that, what, what makes up that kind of um, information, that kind of quality, mostly it's going to be using short sentences, um, writing using the right tense, not making grammatical errors, and writing concisely. So here's an example, um, not from my journal, I should say. We wouldn't be brave enough to write anything like this. This is from another editor. This paper fell well below my threshold. I refuse to spend time trying to understand what the author is trying to say. Besides, I really want to send a message that they can't submit garbage to us and expect us to fix it. My rule of thumb is that there are more than six grammatical errors in the abstract. I don't waste my time carefully reading the rest. Um, and I, I can certainly say I didn't say this, but I could have said it. Um, um, but I mean, in, in where, where we're at in osteopathy, I think it's important to be developmental for new authors. You wouldn't get that kind of level of response. This is probably from a, a journal like Cell or The Lancet or the BMJ, a bigger journal that um, will and can reject papers and turn them around very rapidly. Um, so do publishers correct language? Now, the answer to this is there are lots of proofing stages and, and some of that kind of happens, looking at typos or sentences, there might be suggestions from reviewers or from editors even. But the bottom line is it's down to the author. Um, it's their piece of work, 
and, and they need to write it as carefully and clearly as they can. It's not going to be up to the editor to, to rewrite and, and reconstruct uh, papers. Something at the International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine we have done in the past to help authors along, um, but now the volume of papers is, is too high and, and it's too onerous a burden to do that. Uh, we could possibly, I, 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 with, with some support, we could maybe put you in touch with a, a mentor or there might be people at the National Council for Osteopathic um, Research in the UK who might be willing to support that kind of activity, but essentially it's down to the author. There are some, for those of you visiting um, the Encore website um, from overseas and English not being your um, first language, um, there are some um, resources available from Elsevier. Well, they will translate copy for you um, and support your writing for a fee. Now, the last time I looked, it was, I think, 150 euros. Um, and the deal is with, with the Elsevier team is that if your paper gets rejected and English language is cited as part of the reason for rejection, um, you'll get your money back or they'll redo the copy, I think. Um, but there are services around, and if it is taking forever and ever to try and rewrite it, it's probably worth making use of a, a professional um, translation service or language editing service. And you can see the um, you can see the, the web link is is there for that for it's at webshop.elsevier.com. So, an overview: it's about clarity, objectivity, accuracy, and brevity. Um, Thinking about sentence construction, um, looking for tenses, incorrect tenses. I'm on draft eight of a paper I'm writing at the moment. I just can't see, it, see what's written anymore and just looked at it again and seen some problems with the tense of a, a, a paragraph um, and some inaccurate grammar. So it takes time to, to spot these things. Um, but again, go back to that guide for authors, which will be a helpful, um, give you some helpful tips on language specifications. So what you need to do is... Think about the language in the context of the reviewers and editors and readers being able to understand your messages clearly. Refer to that, refer to that guide for authors. Check for short sentences, correct tenses, correct grammar, and it's all in English or the language of the journal. Get a native speaker to um, check your submission before submitting it. Now to the structure of the article. Again, most, uh, most journals lay out in their guide for authors the particular structure that they want um, an article submitted in. Um, the International Journal of Medicine, Osteopathic Medicine, has also got guidance in that area. Uh, and I just thought I'd put in some, some comments. These are from um, both reviewers and editors um, from our journal. And um, you can read these on, at your leisure. But, but some of the main points here are that the reviewers are commenting here on the submission looking like a thesis, um, summarizing forthcoming chapters. Now, if it looks like that, that's not going to get published as an article because um, manuscripts and journal articles aren't theses. They have to be distinct on their own. So it'll get rejected. It needs to be in the format of the journal. This review has put, with substantial reworking in a more conventional format, we'd certainly reconsider the submission. Actually, this might be the editor. Um, but at this point, it is better to reject the paper and to encourage the authors to rework it prior to possible future submission. Here's another one. The instruction to, auth to authors have not been followed at all for this paper. Requires substantial rewrite, etc., etc. Have a look at those. We get comments like that from our reviewers quite often. So what is the structure? Uh, mostly it follows an IMRAD, which is the introduction, um, the, the main, main part of the article, um, the methods, the results, and the discussion. Um, that's, most journals follow that format. And that's important as well because the title and the abstract, they're the, the, the words that are used for um, indexing. And nowadays, um, everyone searches journal databases, um, PubMed or Science Direct is the Elsevier platform, um, or CINAHL, there are lots of um, journal databases or research databases. And how good the title, the abstract, and the, the key words are will help enhance the ability for other people to find it. In the end, we're publishing research. We're not doing it for ourselves, although it might be personally gratifying. In the end, it's about a community of practice and helping other people to use new information, ultimately to make patient care better, or education, or whatever the context of your research is in. Um, 
most people, most people will go um, in the flow of an article, will go from general in the introduction, kind of what's the problem, here it is, low back pain affects, I think everyone watching this will have seen this a lot, low back affects the majority of the population, it is a cost of society, um, and it's high in terms of health utilisation and causes distress to the population in general. Then you go down to the specifics, so people are concerned about psychological um, um, psychological factors in the progression of back pain and then into a specific which would be something like um, catastrophizing or fear as a particular concern has been little research, well been a lot research now um, and then you go into that specific area so what you're looking at doing is going from the general into the specific and then again at the end of your article you'd go general again so um, the order of writing changes. Some people go for figures and tables, methods, results, and then do the introduction and conclusions. That's up to the individual. So what about titles? Now, it needs to be really tight and concise. You know, tight titles, simple, clear titles get cited more often than others. And citation is an index of how um, your article has been used in the academic community. So it needs to adequately describe the content of a paper. So it's what are the main issues of the paper? Um, what's the subject? Um, it needs to be accurate, unambiguous. I think it's helpful if it's got the methods in it as well, a, a small nod towards the methods. If it's something about um, people will be looking for different um, type of methodology or thinking about different inferences they can make from different studies. So if it's a study looking at expectations, for example, it's helpful if folks know that it's been a cross-sectional survey it would be a different thinking to if they know it's been a focus group, for example, about expectations. And a different other people, when they're looking for articles, might be looking for different types of methodologies. Articles with short, catchy titles are often better cited. So the abstract, there are lots of abstracting indexing services. I uh, mentioned some already. Um, this is really the shop window for your article. You know? When people who are seriously looking for content to read, to inform themselves, or to do further research. They're going to be doing a title search, and if the titles grab them, they'll open up the search engine and they'll look at abstracts. And that's your shop window. Now, if it's kind of cobwebs and it's got old stock in it that isn't really relevant to what you've got to say in your article, people aren't going to look. It's got to be germane to what you're saying in your article. So make it interesting, easy to be understood, understood um, and those main messages, you know, if someone says, what's the outcome of your research, what are your main messages? Those one, two, maybe three maximum, those key messages have to be in that abstract. Accurate and specific um, and brief. It's hard, writing abstracts is hard, concisely, and it's just plain old painful, leaving out lots of important stuff you spent ages thinking about and, and doing and important results that just aren't quite as important as those top three things. So when you're using keywords, um, you need to think about these as labels for your manuscript. That's how they're going to be um, um, indexed. So those indexes will be classifying your article based on the keywords. Um, sometimes it's helpful to have a look at the guide for authors to see how many keywords and the, the style of presenting them. So what about the introduction now? Moving on to the structure. We've talked about the title and the abstract. Now the introduction. Um, so this is the kind of beginning of your argument. I know people read articles in different orders, but if someone's actually downloaded your article, they've paid for it, they've printed it out, here they go, they're probably going to have a look at your introduction. So this is the beginning of the argument, and this is your opportunity to say, actually, this is an important topic, and it's going to look like I've got something interesting to say here. So that summary at the beginning, this is the big picture. So if it's about um, the big picture, it might not be about um, parochial osteopathy in Aberdeen. It might be the big picture, might be manual therapy or musculoskeletal um, services or the epidemiology of back pain or, or of, of shoulder pain or, or the psychology of expectations in general. That will be the big picture, which puts context in your work. And then going down a level, it will be osteopathy services maybe in Aberdeen or in um, Southwark, where we are today. You need to be brief and, and clearly have kind of answers to the following, which is, what's the problem? What's the big problem? 
Now you've got the big picture and then the specific. This is the problem that I'm addressing. Um, a review in brief of key papers in the field. Anyone else in the field will know the area and if you've missed out a seminal paper or you've picked out a viewpoint in an editorial in um, fictitious osteopathy tomorrow um, and you're citing that editorial from um, begins and blogs rather than or excluding, instead of excluding the systematic review, the Cochrane review, which actually looked at the topic, then probably the reviewer is going to pick up on it, that you've been selective with your literature and you're not aware of this notion of different types of evidence and the strength. You might mention the editorial, but you wouldn't put it at the top of your list, maybe. Um, of the existing solutions or, or existing um, treatments or existing methodologies, kind of what's out there at the moment that you think is the best or may, might be an indication of the approach you've adopted, but what are the problems? What are the gaps? Why have you taken on your project? What, what are the main limitations there? And what are your aims? So in the end, you've got this argument where you've got the broad brush topic, um, where it centers the specifics of the problem you're addressing, maybe some of the nitty gritty of why it's an issue, and then at the end of it, You've got, therefore, I'm doing this research. And if you've done it well, your reader will be gagging to read your methods. How's he approached this? How's she approached this? What, what, what has she done? What are the results here? I can see this is really important. They'll be really hungry to read the article. Um, and, of course, that's all in the context of the journal itself. So have a look at the journal. Have a look at other introductions. Look at how they're structured. So the methods, this is important. Um, obviously, this is the bit, replication is very important in science, and readers should really be able to have a good sense of what you've done, to judge the quality of what you've done, but also to be able to repeat it if necessary. Replication is a key part. And that includes an analysis section. One of the frustrations if you're trying to look at work and repeat work, or if you're trying to really understand something, is if it's not clear how the analysis has been done, you can't ever see how you've got from the kind of methods to the results. You don't know if people have collapsed a scale in a particular way or they've summarised information in a particular way and it comes from nowhere and you just can't figure out how it is. And Now hopefully reviewers will point that out but really it's down to you to make that as clear as possible because reviewers don't always spot this kind of thing. Um, if the work's been done or it's a very established method uh, you don't need, you can refer to it rather than describe it in detail. Normally you'd want to identify equipment and the materials used, be they questionnaires or electromyographic measurements, whatever they might be. Ethics committee approval. I know some osteopathic um, institutions don't have access to a formal ethics committee, but in some way it must be reviewed. Um, the International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine certainly, I think all journals now want some sort of statement of um, ethical review. And of course of course, um, editors themselves, if they've got concerns, can um, make a call on it or ask for extra information. If you're publishing case material, we didn't really talk about that earlier when we were talking about types of manuscript. There's a real need in osteopathy for some very clear and well-argued and evidenced case um, reviews and case scenarios. Um, some evidence that the patient concerned has been asked for their consent to be used because it's not just an issue of anonymity but also of confidentiality and it's uh, uh, the kind of thing that you'd expect for a case review is that the patient had given permission for their uh, data to be used. So when you get to the results, this red thread, it's really following on from the argument. It's what are those main findings? So it might not be all findings, you'll have to let go of some stuff that you thought when you were designing the study was particularly important, but to make a cohesive and clear story, the main findings, the findings from the experiments, the findings from the survey you described in the methods section. You might want to particularly highlight findings that are different from um, a previous work. Um, you'll of course report results of statistical and other analyses. Now when talking about stats, uh, we will go a bit snow blind with stats, but I think it's worth remembering that statistics are there. They're essentially summary models. The idea is to summarize it because um, any analysis, it's about a summary. How can you can make it more accessible to, to readers? So not everybody will go through each questionnaire and go, oh, that's a high score, low score, or even every interview. The idea is a summary. So you're using statistics to summarize effectively those data that you've collected so that readers can make judgments about it. And it's helpful, I think, to think about what statistics am I going to use? How can I summarize this well so the readers will really understand what I'm getting at? 
um, rather than what esoteric statistics can I use to bewilder and baffle my, my readers. Uh, or, or if the statistics are particularly difficult to understand, it might be worth including a reference in the analysis section to, to, to where people can understand it more clearly. So results, um, illustrations and, and visual summaries of, of results are particularly important. They're a very efficient way to present um, uh, data. Uh, and if, if your reviewers and readers can flick to results and see a clear summary visually, um, they'll, they'll access the data much more clearly. Um, captions and legends. Um, you, you know I'm just well, I'm GCSE and, and primary school doing graphs with the kids and stuff. X and Y axis labelling. Important stuff, important at this level as well. The amount of the time you get tables and or graphs come through and there aren't clear labels. Um, and so what you have to do as a reader, you have to think, oh gosh, back to the methods. What are they measuring here? What was that again? And as soon as you, the reader is stumbling around trying to find out and interpret um, um, the information, it's a bigger, bigger task for them and certainly a harder cognitive task for reviewers and, and you, you'll lose your audience. So make sure everything's clearly labelled as best you can. Don't people tend to start, when they're starting writing for the first time, feel that they need to write in text, narrative, the same thing that's in the tables? It's best you Maybe highlight one point out of a table, but if it's in a summary table, it's in a summary table. So the characteristics of the response to the survey are in table one. Not 50% of men, 50% of women, the average age was da -da 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 -da, and then all that information is in the table as well. Don't need to put in two places at once. Don't duplicate results. On to the discussion. Now this is your opportunity to talk about what the results actually mean. And if you're going to do it well, you're going to do it um, in the context of available literature. And it's the most important section, really. It's most important because you've grappled with this subject for a long time. You may have particular and considerable expertise. And it's your opportunity to pull on that expertise, pull on that wider reading, to really make some interpretation, put some context, what do these mean, what are the implications of these results. Now, it's sometimes tempting to deviate away from the results so I, I often see that in manuscripts, so that although the results tell maybe a tale that actually it looks like, in this instance, this study doesn't really show osteopathy in this instance to be particularly effective. And then the discussion will kind of drift away from the results into, actually, it really is. You know, and despite this, or we need to do more research, you know, it really is about interpreting those results. You might be looking at limitations. You might be looking at a way of explaining your results in terms of the methodology. But the discussion is really the, the engine of the paper. And you do need to compare and contrast your results to other studies in the field. Now moving on to the conclusion. So that's, uh, the conclusion is in, important as well, because often people again will skip straight to the conclusion. And that's a, a brief statement of how your results, your discussion results, kind of what you can draw from it, but it has to be drawn from the results, should be clear, um, it should justify your work um, as a, an example of the, the, the main points that are coming out. So one of the ways you can do that is by looking at future research. So here I've got my results. It looks like um, osteopathy in this instance, um, treating um, healthy normals reduces pain pressure threshold in the thoracic spine. That might be an example of one of your conclusions you might say further work needs to be done to test whether um, um, changes in healthy normals can be replicated in patients with thoracic pain. That would be a, an example. Or some specific questions might be actually you found it's quite difficult to measure pain pressure threshold. So further research is indicated looking at methodologies to measure pain pressure threshold in the thoracic spine, for example. So use your specific knowledge, and that's what we're interested in, not general, like more research is good, bigger numbers is good. No, but your specific knowledge, having done the work. Now with references, it's um, important to um, kind of, it's important to let the reviewers, the readers know the main papers in the field that you've drawn on. Um, not all the papers in the field, but that idea I mentioned a little bit earlier about um, let, letting your reader know what are the important papers. So having some sense of judgment and some discrimination based on your appraisal of the value of papers you're citing. 
so not too many references. Um, make sure that you've fully absorbed the material um, when you're citing material. So, for example, and what did I see the other day? There was a paper on, oh, I can't remember, there was a citation supported by, um, which said something like, I don't know, shoulder pain is highly prevalent um, in Western countries and causes lots of distress. Um, and then when I looked at the, the citation, I looked at the article, it came from a study looking at sort of pain pressure thresholds or something like that. If you go back to the original article, actually, it's those authors... They did say it, but what they've done is they've summarised three or four cited pieces of material from the epidemiology about shoulder pain. And so they've said it, but they've summarised other information. So if you're citing someone else's summary of someone else's work, that's not really helpful. It doesn't guide your reader to, if they want to check up, well, what, what's the epidemiology? That looks interesting. How, how prevalent is shoulder pain? How, what, what's going on here? They go to your reference. No, they don't find it. So go to those original re references. Check that you've understood the context and the meaning of the research. So the focus of an individual paper, not just the material they cite in the discussion or um, indeed summarise maybe in the introduction. Avoid excessive self-citations should you be in the um, position to cite yourself. Um, and try and be, have a broad spread of citations rather than all from the USA, for example, or all from the UK. Um, it is, it is important to, to, again, look at the guide for authors. It, it's frustrating for referees to say, you know, look at the guide for authors about references time and time again. I think our journal, we've just changed the style to make it easier because when you speak to authors, one of the most frustrating, time-consuming wastes of time is fiddling about with references and formatting references. And it's much easier now with um, reference management software that's readily available. Um, um, to use standard templates and it's worth checking uh, with the journal website if there are any standard templates available that you can then import into your reference management software. Now, we, we, we've got references, we've got the manuscript, we're uh, excited on the edge of um, submitting it. Now you have an opportunity to write a cover letter with your manuscript normally and now this is the only time you've got with a, a chance, a voice, to speak to the editor and it's worth doing it. Highlight, you know, briefly, not kind of another 3,000 or 4,000 words, but what are the key points for that editor? Why do you think that this paper has got something useful and interesting to add to, remember, it's all an argument, to add to that editor's journal? Because that editor is going to be getting it saying, yes, no, out to review, not out to review. So put in that, that letter which says, this is important to your journal because of this, this, and this. If there are any particular... And things of note, it might be um, a little unlikely in osteopathy, but maybe there's, there's conflict between osteopathic education institutions, for example, or competition. You might say, oh, I, I don't think it should be ref uh, refereed by these people. You might have some distinctions if, if it's, it's... I think that happens more if in, on competing labs who've got very different views of a particular way of doing research, for example. Um, but if there are any special requirements, you can mention them in that cover letter. Um, revisions. Now, I have a colleague who will remain nameless who always says, oh, let the reviewers have something to do. Um, my view is don't let the reviewers do anything at all and revise your manuscript before submission. Uh, you want to get it as good as it can be before su submission. So vet the manuscripts thoroughly as possible and get at least one other person to have a read through if you've been drafting it on your own because in the end you can't always see things because you've been looking at it so hard. So submit your manuscript. It's a little bit like waiting for an exam result or even waiting for Christmas to come, whilst you're waiting for a response. Um, now, after the submission, you know, you've got to wait. Now, refereeing can take... You can get a decision. I have successfully been rejected within three hours from some journals. Um, big journals with a big editorial team and full-time staff can process manuscripts very quickly. Um, if all goes quiet from a big journal, it's going to go out for review, which is good news. But that process can take kind of between two weeks and five months. Um, sometimes the, the editor will go through this process in a moment. The editor will be looking and looking for, for reviewers. But in the end of the day, you'll, you'll receive a letter back or some communication back from the editor, which will be some sort of decision, which will be accept it with no changes, which is um, I've seen once in the time I've been editing a journal only. 
accept with revisions, these to be minor or major, or reject, you know, it's not, it'll normally be outside the scope of the journal, or not the quality they want, or doesn't fit the editorial profile. It'll be one of those decisions. Now, the peer review business is, as I said, reviewers are mostly doing this in their own time, gratis, for free. Um, and the idea is that it's a quality enhancement um, thing, so that a reviewer will read it and say, actually, this is, this is a manuscript which has got promise, but what about this, this, and this? Make those comments, and they'll go back to the authors, and the authors normally will say, actually, that's a really good point, I can do this, do that. Occasionally, the authors say, no, that's not a good point, because this, that, and the other. And then it'll be for the editor to, to make a judgment about that argument or not. But in general, it improves the quality of the research submitted for publication, um, and it gives the opportunity of the reviewers the opportunity to suggest improvements. Now, we've got, I've gone through those different um, outcomes, and here's a little um, nasty little diagram I've got here. And it, it, it's probably worth, just worth briefly going through this, um, just so that you know what to expect. When an article gets submitted, um, normally you'll get a confirmation of receipt, and that gets generated by the journal uh, management system itself, and then it'll go to the editor. So the editor at that stage can say no, like the article I was mentioning about earlier about major trauma after horrible car accidents. I didn't send that out to reviewers. I'd say, actually, no, I'm afraid it doesn't fit. Or if I get an article in that's poorly formatted or, um, and the content is all over the place or the methods aren't in there, or there's no, I might say, no, actually, I can see that's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to be, it's just going to, if we send it out to review, there'll be lots of comments and there isn't enough, um, there isn't enough in this manuscript for it to go. If you do decide to get it to, uh, and uh, I should say, sometimes at that point, the editor might say, actually, can you go and look at the guide to authors and reformat it? If you reformat it, I will send it out to review, but I'm not going to send it out to review at the moment because the reviewer will spend all his time saying it's not in the format for the journal. So that sometimes happens. But otherwise, the editor will say, right, it's going out to review. He'll then hunt for reviewers on his system, um, on the, the software or through his network or his list, his database of reviewers, and looking for an expert in that area. He's published previously in the area. He's known expertise. Then the invitation will go out to the reviewer and say, something like, do me a favour, can you read and review this manuscript? Uh, there might be things on it, uh, it won't be written like that, it'll be say, oh, you know, for the journal and you'll get a bit of access to this database and thank you very much and da 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 But in the end, it's do me a favour. So the reviewers are doing this gratis. And then a response will come back. Now that response from reviewers can come back in a day, it can come back in three weeks. And at three weeks or four weeks, sometimes after delays and reminders and this, that and the other, um, the reviewer might say, no, I won't do it. And so you've got to start again. So that's kind of four weeks gone without an answer. And we do chase reviewers. Or it might be the reviewer will say yes and then not do it. And all of those things can happen. You only have to uninvite and say, thank you very much this time. I hope you'll review again in the future. But on this occasion, we're going to look for somebody else to do it. So there can be a bit of a time delay in there. Anyway, once they've accepted and they've done the review, the reviewers will come back to the editor or the editors will have a look at it together and say, does this fit, does it not? If, it's, if the reviewers say, no, 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 it's likely the editor will say, no, I'm sorry, it's been to review, here are the comments, for this reason we're not going to publish it. Alternatively, um, the editor might say, okay, the reviewers are very positive, we'll accept it, da, 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 da. or it might be, can you make these revisions? Now, it could be, can you make these revisions, these are major revisions, and when you made them, I need to, as editor, to, to get them checked again by reviewers. So make them, and then we'll send it out to review again. It's not a guarantee of publication or anything like that. Or it might be they say, there's some minor points here. So this paragraph isn't clear enough, or I'm not quite sure about the table. this table, it needs annotating more clearly, or your citation here isn't small little things. And that would be a minor, minor revision. And once those things have been checked, it might go back to reviewers, or it might be the editor checking it, be accepted, and the article will sent, be sent off to the publisher for um, type, uh, typesetting and scheduling. And nowadays, most articles at that stage, once the proofs have been done, they appear on the uh, website for, um, as a paper in press, as a PDF. OK, so for, um, for, for some final resources, um, I should thank you all for 
if you managed to watch through the whole video um, online and got through the end of my slides. There are some um, submission and writing tips and author services at elsevier.com. Um, if, you, or if you just search Google on Elsevier and authors, you'll find the material. They've got some slides and podcasts using some of these slides that I've used today, but with a, a different speaker, more general. There are some online training and tutorials um, available at the trainingdesk.elsevier.com, which tell you about using their electronic manuscript um, submission system. And also for reviewers, and we're always keen to hear from reviewers, you can contact the journal um, through the journal website and contacting the, the journal um, management, office, um, management office via via email, which is available on the International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine's website. Um, if, you, if you contact the journal office and send your CV, it would be fantastic because we're always looking for new reviewers for the journal. Um, other than that, uh, a few acknowledgements. My colleagues, um, Nick Lucas and Rob Moran, who are also editors of the journal. Nick's in Australia, Rob's in New Zealand. They set the journal up um, some years ago. Um, Elsevier Publishing for the slide set. And Brenda Mullinger, who, who wrote a very helpful manuscript. This is available to, I think it's all available online to those, to osteopaths, uh, certainly in the UK, um, via the Ozone, um, and indeed um, to osteopaths in Australia as well. If you look at the International Journal of Osteopathic Medicine, um, the reference is on the slides, and it's a helpful manuscript, detailed manuscript about how to write um, uh, a first manuscript. So that's available as well, and thanks very much for your attention.